Good day, everyone. This is Chris back again with The Ancient Scholar, and this is uh, video three and a, a series of videos on introduction to um, cardiovascular and uh, clotting pharmacology for respiratory therapists. Um, I'll continue along where I left off. Um, I would like to add, and this actually is a bit more relevant for the last lecture, but I look, would like to add uh, just a couple things in regards to um, overdose or toxicities. Uh, particularly with lidocaine and amiodarone. Uh, with lidocaine toxicity uh, can occur with uh, lidocaine. Uh, generally not. Patients generally can tolerate fairly high doses of, of lidocaine, but um, because lidocaine blocks sodium channels, um, it can obviously affect uh, the nervous system physiology. And um, uh, one of the things you need to be careful about is uh, the, the development of seizures and altered mental status in patients who have uh, become lidocaine toxic. And this may happen in people with impaired um, hepatic function. Uh, their ability to metabolize uh, those lidocaine may be um, impaired because it is uh, extensively metabolized um, through the liver. Uh, another thing to be careful about, in addition to QT interval prolongation with amiodarone, is the fact that um, certain patients can develop um, pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, typically, this happens in patients that are taking amiodarone orally uh, for an extended period of time. Um, but pulmonary um, amiodarone-associated pulmonary fibrosis is a respiratory-specific um, issue that can occur. Um, and, and as always, as you guys are working through your drug cards, uh, be mindful of some of the major um, drug interactions that can occur between these different medications because um, any, all, any and all the antidysrhythmics can be significantly proarrhythmic, and that is to say that they can create uh, dysrhythmias um, even though you're, you're giving them to treat dysrhythmias. Um, so there's a very fine line that we walk sometimes when we attempt to treat uh, certain cardio cardiac dysrhythmias uh, with medications because those very medications can in fact cause uh, dysrhythmias. Uh, so just kind of pay close attention to some of the major uh, medication interactions that you're going to run into while you're working through your uh, drug cards uh, homework. Okay, so we'll continue on. Uh, now we're going to uh, talk about something a little different. And these are um, what we call presser, or sometimes we call these adrenergic or presser agents. And these are agents that work primarily on the autonomic nervous system. And um, the, the way that I like to think about these agents is I, I like to draw a line, a straight line on the, uh, the board. And I may actually be able to do that here. Let's, let's find out. Oh, look at that. So we have a little arrow here. Let's see if it'll allow me to, to make it larger. Well, what I'll do is I'll put an arrow here. And I'll put an arrow here, okay? And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you just to draw, imagine a line between these two arrows. And on this side here, I'm going to have pure beta. So all pure beta effects are going to uh, be here. And then I think about pure alpha effects in here. And then the middle is a combination of alpha and uh, beta effects. So let's see how that works out. Um, so when we get to talking about these different agents, um, it's it's easier to think about you know what receptor do they uh, do they do they work on specifically, and um, where are we going to have a mechanism of action? So what I'm going to do is I'll just put a little arrow here in the middle as well for uh, combination. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about pure beta two effects over here. Um, so pure beta 2 um, or uh, pure beta effects, um, beta 1 and beta 2, it looks like it got cut off a little bit here, uh, but predominantly what we care about are the beta 2 effects for cardiac, uh, or beta 1 rather, excuse me, beta 2 effects of course are the lungs. Um, and the medication that really focuses on beta effects is a medication called dobutamine. Okay, dobutamine is a catecholamine derivative. If you remember from prior lectures, a catecholamine is, is um, defined as a molecule that has two hydroxyl groups attached to a catechol nucleus or a benzene ring, um, followed by a side chain with an amine group in it. 
and that is the chemical definition of a catecholamine. So this is a type of catecholamine, um, but it is specific to uh, beta receptors, specifically beta-1 receptors. So if I were to administer dobutamine to somebody, the indications um, for administering dobutamine, it's administered as a, a continuous infusion, really are going to affect the contractility of the heart to increase myocardial contractility. So dobutamine is a medication that we sometimes see given to patients that are having uh, certain types of heart failure where we want to um, enable the ventricles to um, have increased or enhanced contractility. Um, now this can help improve cardiac output, um, but also telling the heart to contract harder can make the heart work harder and that can actually use up myocardial oxygen um, supply and cause more problems. So dobutamine is something we have to be real careful about administering. Um, now moving on, so we have beta over here, moving on to pure alpha effects um, are two different types of medications that we run into, norepinephrine or levofed. Uh, norepinephrine is generic, levofed is a trade name, and neosinephrine. Um, these are both medications that are given as an IV infusion, just like the dobutamine. Um, norepinephrine or levofed is much more commonly used than neosinephrine. These medications work primarily on alpha-1 receptors. Uh, so these cause vasoconstriction. And, of course, that will um, increase blood pressure, increase um, peripheral vascular resistance um, to do that. Uh, this medication in particular, norepinephrine, is commonly used for a specific kind of shock known as septic shock, where a patient is um, or has gone into shock as a result of an overwhelming um, infection, primarily a bacterial infection, and it can be both gram-negative and gram-positive uh, bacteria causing these infections. And, of course, uh, certain types of toxins are released that cause the blood vessels to dilate, become permeable and leaky. We call that increased uh, capillary permeability. Fluid spills out of them. Our blood pressure gets low, and our patient is generally uh, very ill. Um, in septic shock. Norepinephrine is a medication that we can give and it doesn't necessarily stimulate the heart as much like the dobutamine but it really focuses on al alpha-1. Um, neosinephrine is another medication that could be given IV. Also neosinephrine is a medication um, that can be administered topically and sometimes you see that given to patients that have uh, what's known as epi epistaxis or nosebleeds to constrict the vessels um, in the nasal mucosa and tamponade that bleeding. And then um, we also have another medication that works on every adrenergic receptor, um, alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 in particular, and that is epinephrine. Um, epinephrine can be given for a variety of different reasons. Uh, one reason, which we'll talk about a little later on, is for anaphylactic shock. Uh, epinephrine is uh, very effective, um, and we talked about this in the first lecture as well, so I won't spend a whole lot of time there. Um, but epinephrine can also be given as a continuous infusion to um, treat uh, perhaps septic shock or perhaps um, a very low heart rate, what we call bradycardia that's causing problems. Um, lots of different reasons for administering epinephrine infusions. And one thing we need to know is that epinephrine affects all receptors, uh, both your alpha and your beta receptors. So it is nonspecific, whereas your norepinephrine and your neo are more specific to alpha-1 or more selective to alpha-1. And your dobutamine is more selective to, well, beta receptors, um, even though it says beta-2 here, it's really the beta-1 receptors that we um, care about. Okay, just moving on. Um, I wanted to talk about another vasopressor called dope, dope, ah, dopamine, not dobutamine, dopamine. And you can see on the bag here, the picture of the bag, it's actually DOP to prevent people from getting confused, dopamine. And dopamine is another catecholamine type medication, but it is very interesting. And dopamine is, again, a continuous infusion. The dose, uh, I'm going to cover the dose because it is such a frequently administered medication is 2 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute IV infusion. And dopamine has what we call a triphasic dose response. And that is to say that depending on the dose that we administer, we're going to get different effects. So if I give what we call our low dose, 2 to 5 mics per kilogram per minute, this is what we call the renal regime. 
and I actually have dopaminergic receptors that are activated in the kidneys and I can increase my urinary output. Now this has um, become contested in recent years and there are providers that do not think that this is um, necessarily the case or it's not a significant case anymore. Um, moving on to the next dosing regime, from 5 to 10 mics per kilogram per minute, I get what are called my cardiac or my beta-1 effects with dopamine. Um, this is where I get my increased heart rate, my increased contractility. Um, so patients that are maybe perhaps they are in heart failure or perhaps um, they have very slow heart rates, such as a clinically significant bradycardia, you can give them the 5 to 10 a mic per kilogram per minute dose, and um, you can increase contractility, increase heart rate. Um, and then finally, the high dose of uh, dopamine is the 10 to 20 mics per kilogram per minute, and this is what we call the presser dose. And at the high dose is where I get my alpha-1 effects, okay? And this is where I get vasoconstriction, increased peripheral vascular, peripheral vascular resistance, and increased blood pressure. And at this dose, I may look at um, treating, say, septic shock. So dopamine is an interesting medication, and depending on the dose that I administer, I get different effects. So it is a very effective medication, and it is a very flexible um, adrenergic medication, if you will, and allows you, uh, it's one medication that can be used to treat several different um, issues. So it is fairly commonly administered, and it is one of the um, medications that I wanted to focus in on. Okay, I want to go ahead and just cover the clotting cascade real quick before we go into uh, some of the clotting medications. Um, I would like to say, before I move into this too much, one thing that you need to be very careful about with the vasopressor medications, and that includes um, all of the, um, the dopamine, the norepinephrine, the epinephrine, if those medications were to leak out of the vessel and um, uh, infiltrate into the surrounding tissue, there can be necrosis. Um, because they can sh they can cause uh, vessels to constrict, and they can decrease the blood supply to that area, and you can actually have necrosis of the skin. So if I have infiltration of those, it needs to be noted right away. The infusion needs to be stopped and restarted in a good vein, and um, you may need to administer a, a medication, an alpha blocker medication, that will help open those vessels back up called phentolamine. Um, uh, preferably, if patients are going to be on vasopressor infusions for an uh, extended period of time, we actually like to insert a large catheter into a central vein called a central line, administer the medications, the pressors, through the central line. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit the uh, clotting cascade real quick. The clotting cascade is interesting, and uh, this is just a quick down and dirty anatomy and physiology review. You have two pathways to what I call the yellow brick road, if you will. I have the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is a result to tissue outside of the blood vessel. Okay, So this is not within. So this may be something like inflammation. Tissue thromboplastin is released, um, and it activates factor 10. And then I have prothrombin becoming thrombin and fibrinogen becoming fibrin, which is ultimately um, a clot. This is a what I like to call a reader's digest version. This is down and dirty, stripped down for high yield information. Um, the intrinsic pathway is damaged to to the blood vessel. Collagen becomes exposed. Um, Cascade of events occur. It eventually leads to what I like to call the yellow brick road of the clotting cascade. Um, Factor 10 is activated, prothrombin to thrombin, fibrinogen to fibrin, and a um, fibrin blood clot. Um, what I want to focus in on are some lab tests that will become important here when we start getting into the clotting medications. Um, the PTT, or the partial thromboplastin time, is a measure of the intrinsic pathway, okay, of the clotting factors within the intrinsic pathway, how effective it's working. And the PT, I, uh, the PT or prothrombin time, or the INR, the international normalized ratio, measures the extrinsic pathway and how effective it's working. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I think I'm going to cut it off here and I'll get into the anticoagulants, antiplatelets, and fibrinolytic medications proper in uh, the next uh, video. Okay, guys, as always, thanks for hanging in there.